I'm Courtney. Welcome to our Whalen Library virtual event. Tonight we're very excited to have Professor Edward Malilo here to talk about his new book, The Butterfly Effect, Insects and the Making of the Modern World. Yeah. There it is. And here is yours, which is also available. So Yay. put in your holds. Um, Edward Malilo is a professor of history and environmental studies at Amherst College, where he teaches courses on global environmental history, excuse me, the history of the Pacific world, the 19th century United States, and commodities in a world historical perspective. In addition to the butterfly effect, he's the author of Strangers on Familiar Soil, Rediscovering the Chile-California Connection, and editor of two volumes on regional environmental histories. Professor Malilo received his PhD from Yale and his BA from Swarthmore. He grew up on Cape Cod and is coming to us live from his home in South Hadley, Massachusetts. Thank you so much for being here, Professor Malilo. Thank I, you for having me. Sure, I, I have a couple Zoom housekeeping notes. I just wanna make sure I am recording. Okay, so I am recording this session for um, broadcast on Wacam, which is our local cable access channel so you may see uh, a tiny picture of yourself on tv unless you turn off your video um, actually for the presentation part i will be showing only professor malilo and his slides um, <laughs> but after that if you ask questions you might show up so uh, also feel free to add your questions into the chat um, if you like and i will make sure we get to them or you can wait till the end of his presentation uh, I also recommend you switch with you to speaker view so that you will see Professor Molilo next to his slides instead of everyone else. So now that all of that is out of the way, I will hand it over. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you, Courtney, and thank you all for coming tonight. This has been an interesting time to be giving book talks because I'm giving a lot more of them than I might if I had to travel to all of these locations. <laughs> but I would much prefer to be seeing you in person and meeting you live. But you're, this is kind of intimate in a way because you're entering my kitchen and getting to see my house plant and I get to enter your kitchens and living rooms. And um, so I'm going to talk for about 20 or 30 minutes and then I will entertain whatever questions you have for me. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on what I've had to say. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen now and then I will open up a few slides here, just images to give us things to talk about. So I'm gonna do that right now. And um, then I will open up this, what I hope you will soon see. Slideshow, okay. Can everyone see the first slide here? Great, great. Okay. And can everyone hear me? I should make sure that you can all hear me loud and clear from the get go here. Yes. So uh, this is my book. It's just come out from Penguin Random House last week. And it was a lot of fun to write. It was kind of a lark for me. My first book was about 222 years of connections between the country of Chile and the state of California. So as you can imagine, I went in quite a different direction thinking about insects and world history. But the project had its genesis in a course that I've taught for a long time, for about 15 years, I've taught a course to my students called Commodities, Nature, and Society. And we study the history of silver, silk, coffee, tea, tobacco, sneakers, microchips, and units of bandwidth in world history. That's a lot of fun to teach. And I had a student do a project on insect commodities. And I had never thought about the fact before that class that two of the most important commodities that many of us are wearing on our bodies and consuming in our daily diets are produced by insects. I'll get to those in just a moment, but I wanted to give the teaser at the outset of why I embarked on this project. I was also really aware that there'd been a lot written about all the awful things that insects do to us. And they certainly do get a bad rap for good reason. If you think about Zika or West Nile virus or malaria or dengue fever, or even just head lice and bed bugs, insects tend to be associated with the negative effects they've had on human history. And there's plenty of writing about that. 
but I decided to take things in a different direction. As I discovered, insects do a remarkable number of things that sustain our everyday lives. And in fact, they're with us all the time, whether we know it or not. You may be surprised after this talk at how much they are indeed with us. Um, so without further ado, I'll kind of do the entomology 101 part of this. I'm not an entomologist. I'm a historian by training and trade. Um, but I, I did have to learn a lot about insects to write this book. And I had a lot of fun learning about what makes an insect an insect. And if you read my book, you'll see the following diagram, which is helpful and useful talking about what constitutes an insect. In fact, all insects have a three-part body. Uh, they have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, as you can see from this diagram of a monarch butterfly. Uh, they all have a semi-transparent exoskeleton. Their skeleton is on the outside of their body, unlike ours, which is inside our body, of course. Uh, they all have three pairs of jointed legs. So all insects are our six-legged cousins. Therefore, spiders are not insects, neither are centipedes nor millipedes, uh, although those are part of the same phylum of arthropods. All insects have antenna. They all have compound eyes, and they all have two pairs of wings. So that's what makes an insect an insect. They're really remarkable creatures. They evolved approximately 400 million years ago, and this is a picture I'm showing you of the largest insects that ruled Earth's prehistoric skies. These were dragonfly-like bugs known as griffin flies. Um, and they were flying juggernauts, as I'm calling them here. Um, and they had two to three foot wingspans. So they were the size of small hawks. You can imagine that was quite an intimidating presence in prehistoric skies. Insects are everywhere on the planet. Entomologists estimate, and this is just a stunning number, that there are some 10 quintillion, that's 10 followed by 18 zeros, individual insects alive on our planet at any one moment. We'll just let that sink in. We're heading towards a planet with 9 billion people, but we're talking about 10 quintillion insects, individual insects. Um, and in recent years, scientists have accepted that there are probably something on the order of 5.5 million insect species. Many of them are beetles, in fact, and I'll get to that later. Insects are everywhere, um, from frigid high mountain uh, environments like this one. This is the Vecu bug on the summit of Mauna Kea, which is on the big island, Hawaii Island of Hawaii, which exists in the snow packs at the top of the mountain. Uh, it has kind of an antifreeze like substance for blood and is able to absorb sunlight and it eats the other creatures that get blown to the top of the mountain and die in the cold winds. Uh, Insects can also be found in the midst of deserts. In the Sahara Desert, there is the Sahara Desert ant, which can sustain itself at temperatures well above 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so insects are all over the place, with perhaps the exception of the ocean on our planet. Often the way insects have been treated is as predators, scourges, uh, and, and irritants in world history. And I'm looking back here at Modern Mechanics magazine uh, from December 3rd, 1930. Will monster insects rule the world? They've been the darlings for the evil villains of many a Hollywood screenplay. And you can just think of the role that insects have played in literature and uh, throughout popular culture as the bad guys. But I began to think about insects in a different way. And it may seem odd to be starting here with Ella Fitzgerald, but I'm gonna take you on a little trip. And I'll begin the trip with three individuals who might seem completely unrelated, and then three objects that also might seem completely unrelated, and point out the ways in which they're intimately tied together. In November 1944, Ella Fitzgerald released a 78 RPM record with the ink spots. Uh, I remember listening to this with my grandparents in their basement. Um, I'm also going to put up an image that seems completely unrelated to this. This is the Ottoman Sultan, Abdul Mesud I, who founded the Hereke carpet manufactory to produce elaborate carpets for his Dolmbache Palace 
on the Bosphorus, and then a third individual, in this case, a dated incident that seems entirely unrelated as well. This is Brigadier General Charles O'Hara surrendering Lord Cornwallis's sword at Yorktown, Virginia in 1781. The chapter one of my book begins with these three individuals and three objects related to them. Ella Fitzgerald's record, one of Sultan Abdul Mesud the first carpets, and the Brigadier General's coat. And the curious thing that stitches all these seemingly disparate objects and individuals together is that they're all the products of insects. In fact, the shellac that made the 78 RPM record the silk from which the Sultan's carpets were stitched and the red dye with which this coat was dyed and colored are all the secretions of insects. And here they are, the stars of the show. This is the Karyalaka bug in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, Bombyx mori, the silkworm in the right, and then this is Dactylopius caucus, the cochineal bug down here at the bottom. So the shellac from the record, the silk from these silkworms, and the cochineal that produced the red dye for the officers' coats that made them red coats of the British Army were all the secretions of insects. Now I'll start with shellac, because this may be one that's totally unfamiliar to you, but if you've got dental fillings, it's probably in your mouth. And if you've taken an aspirin or an enteric coated pill of any kind in recent days, weeks, or months, you've actually swallowed this stuff. You may not know this. Shellac is exuded by these little female Karyalaka bugs that live on the twigs of fig and acacia trees in India and Southeast Asia. And they secrete this material to protect their young from ultraviolet light. It's then harvested by millions of workers who spend their, their, their lives collecting shellac. It's melted down and broken into chips like this, and then it's turned into objects of everyday life. And during the era of the 78 RPM record, which preceded the vinyl era, that starts in the 1940s, all records contain shellac. Those old records you may recall, I remember these from my grandparents' house growing up that had that sound of bacon frying in a pan. That was the 78 RPM record, and it was made out of an insect secretion. Prior to this, though, shellac was also used to house daguerreotypes. These were the first photographs from the 19th century, starting with Louis Daguerre's famous photograph, Boulevard du Temple, in which you'll see in this photograph, a man in the middle at the bottom getting his boot shined. And he's the only person who actually shows up in the image because the exposure time was close to 10 minutes and he was standing still to get his boot blackened. And so there's lots of traffic, but uh, you only see him. And it was, um, these cases that you'll see on the top of this image that were made out of shellac. The images were one of a kind images and were very fragile. So to be able to carry and transport these one of a kind photographs, people made beautiful cases by molding shellac into intricate designs. And I've looked at many of these in various collections across the United States and they have a fascinating array of themes from Greek mythology to patriotic themes to just beautiful um, antique designs like this one. Later, shellac became used in all sorts of everyday products. When you shellac your deck, you're of course using the product of an insect secretion, but nail polish, fast drying nail polish is made out of shellac as well. And when you go to the grocery store and see a shiny fruit on the shelf, it's highly likely that it is coated again in an insect secretion. This is the wax that's on apples to keep the water in the apple and keep them looking really pretty on the shelf. Now, you might ask, why aren't we using synthetic substitutes? Why are we still relying on an insect for these day-to-day -day products? Well, part of the story I tell in my book is that after World War II, there was this notion that the synthetic age had emerged and all of these natural products would be replaced with things that had been made in laboratories. However, there were two problems with that that arose. One was that many of those synthetic alternatives were toxic to the human body and caused cancer. 
Secondly, engineers found that they couldn't do it as well as many creatures in nature do it. Engineers have never been able to make something quite as strong and pliable as silk in the laboratory. They've come up with decent substitutes, but still naturally produced silk is the top of the line in all sorts of industries, from its surgical applications to the fashion industry. And so one of the one of the narratives of my book is that the synthetic age that promised to take us away from these natural products that I'm discussing with you tonight, it turns out did not fulfill all those promises. And so we've had a massive large scale return to depending on insects for these everyday objects that are ubiquitous in our lives. In fact, shellac is in candy. My son was intrigued to find this out. He's a seven year old and loves to trick or treat. And we've looked on the boxes of things that he got last Halloween. And this confectioner's glaze is indeed produced by insects on twigs of fig and acacia trees in Southeast Asia. And it's coating all of the candy that your kids or grandkids or maybe even great grandkids are eating at Halloween. And here are harvesters in India, uh, Thailand and Burma cutting shellac off of tree branches. I'll move next to talking about silk. This is the next chapter in my book and I had a lot of fun with this because silk is just so fascinating. The production of silk is called sericulture uh, and silk is, is produced, of course, it's spun by silkworms that gyrate their head in a figure eight motion and spin a double thread called brins of silk to make a cocoon as they're changing during their life cycle from egg um, into pupa uh, through the larval stage and then to a grown insect, they spin the silk web around them to protect themselves. Uh, and of course, the food for this process is the white mulberry plant. And one of the things that fascinated me as I was doing the research for this is that each of the insects I was looking at is closely associated with a plant. And the people who've raised these insects in world history have also had to become botanists as well as amateur entomologists. For shellac, it's the fig and acacia trees that people raise to grow the shellac. For silk, it's the white mulberry tree, although colonists in the United States tried to use red mulberries as well, and sometimes met with quite disastrous fates. Ezra Stiles, who actually founded Yale College and was one of the founders of Brown, uh, had tried to raise silkworms and had actually given his parishioners white mulberry plants to grow in their gardens. But several plagues devastated these trees and therefore killed the food source for his silkworms. Um, but you can see kind of an arboreal legacy across the world of places where people have raised silk because you always find the rootstock of mulberry trees there. This is one of my favorite photographs, which is in the book itself. This is a, a grown silkworm moth after it's hatched. Unfortunately, it hardly ever gets to this stage because generally in sericulture, what happens is the cocoon gets tossed into a bath of boiling water, and then the person making the silk pulls the thread out of that bath, and the silkworm moth perishes in that process. Although uh, in India, there's a new type of silk called a himsa silk or peace silk in which they actually release the moth from the cocoon before actually unreeling the silk thread. But I just always enjoy looking at the adult silkworm moth because it's so stunning. Um, and here it is in the cocoon in its final stages. And then here are some of those cocoons. This is a man from Uzbekistan. Um, men reeling silk in Turkestan in the 19th century. Uh, and you can see what they're doing. The man on the left of the screen has a reeler, and then the man on the right has a bath of boiling water, and he's dumping these cocoons in, and the thread is being reeled out. Uh, contemporary silk production in Sichuan province in China, a place where I've spent a lot of time. I started my historical career as a historian of China, so I actually didn't know, but I was doing the background research for this project long before I realized it. Uh, and then a silk loom with contemporary production in Myanmar or Burma today. Um, another picture of silk in Turkey. 
Now in the book, I had a lot of fun as a historian going back and telling the tales of insect commodities in the long distant past. And this is one that my students always enjoy. There was a famous battle at a place called Karhe in Turkey in 53 BCE, I used before the common era, where one of Rome's wealthiest men, Marcus Licinius Crassus, brought his seven Roman legions to face off in battle against Serena, the general of the Parthians of Northeast Persia. And it turns out that this was the first time in world history that the Romans had seen silk. So here we are. Um, I've circled Carhe for you so you can get a sense of location. Um, and you've got to imagine the scene. The Roman legions came over the crest of a sandy desert and in the glare of sunlight, the Parthians unfurled all of their red silk banners, which were some 30 to 40 feet in length. And the Roman legions were paralyzed by this. They'd never seen anything like this blood red silk with the sun shimmering off it. And they froze in their tracks. And the Parthian archers who'd been trained to turn 180 degrees and fire as they retreated, apparently pinned the Romans to the ground with their arrows. Uh, and this is actually an insect encounter in world history as I conceive it, but it's also the origin of the sardonic expression to take a parting shot. <laughs> when you take a dig at somebody, you're like a Parthian taking a parting shot at the Romans. The next of these three insect commodities that I'll tell you a little bit about is cochineal. And the way to remember how to pronounce it, it's uh, very tricky, but is can you coach an eel? My students always like that mnemonic device because it's the way to remember this funny little name. Cochineal is an insect that dwells and consumes nopal cacti. It originated probably in the Peruvian highlands, but where it grows today is in southern Mexico and in northern Peru. This is an opal cacti pad in Oaxaca, Mexico, with a little straw basket stuffed with newspaper in the top, and the female cochineal insects are inside there, getting ready to hatch their young, and then they'll inject their uh, proboscises into the nopal cactus and suck out its sweet juices to feed their young. Um, and here is a dried female cochineal bug. It takes 70,000 crushed bodies of the female cochineal insect to produce a one pound brick of the red dye that comes from these insects. And believe it or not, it was the second most lucrative traded good in the Spanish empire after only silver. Everyone in Europe wanted to get their hands on this deep red dye. Because of course, red was the color of nobility. It was used in ecclesiastical vestments. It signified blood, of course. Kings and queens wore it. I'll show you a few images in a moment. The use of cochineal goes way back to Peru's Paracas culture. Um, and then probably it traveled northward by ship and by land to what's modern day Mexico. And we have all sorts of records in Aztec culture, this is one of the codices showing the Emperor Montezuma II accepting bags of dried cochineal insects. And the stuff was used, as I said, to dye fabrics. And the red coats, of course, um, the elite officers all had cochineal dyed outfits, ecclesiastical vestments, women's dresses. And later, if you look at any of the Impressionists and their paintings, almost all of the red dye that they preferred to use was cochineal dyed paint made from these crushed bodies of female insects raised in rural Mexico. Cochineal tends to be combined with a mordant, that's a type of metal, and depending on what type of metal you combine it with, you can achieve a range of colors, and you can sort of see the the rainbow of reds here stretching all the way from a dark purple up to a kind of blood red at the top there, a scarlet color. Uh, and then here's an image from another one of the codices, these records that the Spanish friars made of life in the Americas right at the time of 
of encounter with the Spanish and the Portuguese. And it's of a, an indigenous man brushing cochineal bugs off of a nopal cactus. And then on the right, you see the female and male insects. The males are kind of lazy. They just mate and then fly away. The females do all the work and make all of the dye, of course. It's actually a chemical secretion to protect the young from other insects, in fact. But it, it yields this remarkable deep red color. And I visited southern Mexico, and there are cochineal farms all over the place. This one says, Bienvenidos, welcome, pase usted, come, come in to our cochineal farm. And then they have a little cartoon of a cochineal bug with a top hat on the right there. Uh, and here's a woman, I photographed her in Oaxaca, Mexico, and she's crushing female insects, much as has been done for hundreds of years with a metate, um, kind of a version of a mortar and pestle. And those white things at the top are the, the female cochineal insects, and she's crushing them to make this red dye. Now, you may not know this, but this red dye, again, is non-toxic, and it's considered by the FDA to be a great substitute for the toxic chemicals that were used after World War II to create reds in foodstuffs. And so everything from Starbucks strawberry frappuccinos to Yoplait fruit on the bottom yogurt, Campari used to use this stuff, fake crab legs in a sushi restaurant, Skittles, candies, has this in it. Uh, Tropicana ruby red grapefruit juice does not get its red from a grapefruit, but instead from the female insect bodies of the cochineal bug. Um, and here it is in ingredients lists. It masquerades by a number of names, a suite of them that I think numbers at least 20, but the most common is carmine. And I had two students in one of my classes who were eating they had apples with them from the cafeteria and fruit on the bottom yogurt with them in class one day. And I said to them, you probably are consuming two insect secretions in one fell swoop there. And they looked up at me and, what is he talking about? And then I gave this a similar lecture to this. Uh, now, as I said, it seemed like at the end of the Second World War, there was gonna be a substitution, a fundamental substitution of a whole host of natural products with things that had been synthesized in the laboratory. One of them that everyone thought was gonna disappear was natural latex. Uh, and they said, it's gonna be synthetic rubber in the future. All car tires, everything's gonna be made of synthetic rubber, as this advertisement from the post-war era shows. Um, and cartoons, of course, uh, played into this theme widely that the casualties of war were going to be the natural industries that relied on natural forms of production to produce the ubiquitous substances that are found in our everyday lives. But it turns out, as I've said, that wasn't the case. And it's the two factors that I mentioned before, the rise of environmental toxicology and the understanding that many synthetic properties of chemicals produced in laboratories were carcinogenic. And then secondly, the inadequacies of laboratory engineering to produce substitutes for many of these natural products. And in the book, I talk about some of these failures with rubber, with blood, with vanilla. But in the case of the three insect commodities I've talked about, this is also the case. They've made major comebacks. We think of them often as sort of prehistoric commodities, but they've made big comebacks in recent years. The other things I had a lot of fun discussing in the book were the ways that insects pervade the institutions that we think of as resolutely modern. Things like genetic laboratory science, agribusiness, the future of food. And it turns out we've depended upon insects for almost all of our understanding of the human genome. And it's this little bugger, the Drosophila melanogaster, which is the fruit fly, that has been the source of most of our understanding of the human genome. As of 2018, there have been eight Nobel Prizes awarded to 18 scientists for their research involving the common fruit fly. Its genome is really similar to ours, but it's much bigger, and they reproduce really quickly. And they reproduce on almost nothing but uh, overripe fruit. So you can imagine it's a great laboratory animal to use as a model system. 
And that's just what this man, Thomas Hunt Morgan, did. He was the pioneer of Drosophila studies. He worked in my hometown of Woods Hole and at Columbia University. And you'll see in the kind of yellow tinted sepia toned image, a bunch of bananas hanging in the middle of the image. And that's because that's what the folks at Columbia University in the so-called fly room were feeding their fruit flies to keep them alive to do all of the pioneering genetic research that's led to our understanding of many genetic disorders and our basic map of the human genome. I also talk in the book about entomophagy, which may be a term that's unfamiliar to you, but it simply means eating insects. And this is where all the millionaires and billionaires are putting their bucks these days. Billionaire Mark Cuban, Bill Gates, Twitter co-founder Biz Stone, they're all investing in insect food, uh, insects for human food, in fact. And most of that is cricket meal. Those are house crickets that are raised in large industrial factories, then they're freeze dried and basically pulverized in grinding machines into flour. And they're being put into everything. If you go on Amazon and look for cricket meal products, the list is stunningly long. But even though this might seem strange to us, for most of the rest of the world, eating insects is not an oddity. Two billion people across the planet regularly eat insects as part of their daily diet. And I have tried all the things that I will show you in the coming images here. When I was in Southern Mexico, I ate these chapulines, which are actually delicious. Uh, they're fried grasshoppers and they're coated in chile and lime. And they've actually stormed across the border and have made inroads into American baseball cuisine. At Safeco Field in Washington and Seattle, uh, there have been 110,000 baskets of chapulines consumed by baseball fans uh, since two years ago when they started being served by the local Mexican stand at the, at the baseball arena. And they've done really well. People like them a lot. Um, this one may be harder to stomach, but in parts of Southern Africa, the Mopani, the Mopane worm, uh, is a delicacy. It's prized for both its taste and for being an extremely high protein ingredient in people's diets. Um, it tastes, I tasted several of these and they're actually not that bad. It kind of tastes like beef jerky. It has a bit of a tobacco-y aftertaste, I'll say. Um, my least favorite that I've tasted is, is bundongi, which is Korean. And those are, those are stir fried or steamed silkworm pupae. And those kind of taste like a cross between a peanut and a shrimp, and you eat them out of a styrofoam cup with a toothpick. Those were not my favorites, but I've, I've tried all these. The football players at Amherst College have also tried this unbeknownst to them. There are a number of companies coming out with protein bars made out of cricket meal as well, because it's a super efficient way to boost the protein uh, in any food product. And uh, my students were eating these at one point, after their football practice and I said, do you know what's in these? And they hadn't looked carefully at the wrapper, but as you'll see, it says exo for exoskeleton made with cricket flour. This is likely the future of food. Um, we're gonna be feeding 9 billion people on the planet and whether we like it or not, the way we're doing it currently is, is incredibly inefficient. Uh, one pound of beef in the United States takes a thousand gallons of water and two acres of grazing land to produce. By contrast, one pound of house crickets takes one gallon of water and two cubic feet of space to produce and it yields three times the amount of protein per unit mass and far more iron and minerals. So from a pragmatic standpoint, you may not want to give up your sirloin steak but I suspect that as we have conversations about what most of the world will be eating in the future, insects are going to play an important role there. And then just to bring us home here, I'll show you a few more images. These are some of the innovative things that cricket meal, the ends to which it's been put. This is cricket pasta made by a company called Bug Salutely. These are cricket brownies, which my son and I have tried. They were fine, they weren't my favorites. 
uh, not what my grandmother made, but they sufficed. Um, and there's just a whole range of, of products that are now being made out of cricket meal. I'll end on this important note. The final chapter in my book is about pollination and the absolutely crucial role that insects play in sustaining our global food systems. And I'll put up just three figures. I don't like putting up a lot of text in my presentations because it can be mind numbing to be on Zoom and have somebody give you lots and lots of words to digest. But these figures are important to note. Bees pollinate 80% of the world's plants, including 90 different food crops. And these range from everything that you're eating on a day-to-day -day basis, your tea, your coffee, almonds, watermelons, you name it. One out of every three bites of food the average human on this planet takes is thanks to bee pollination. Uh, and the honeybee is responsible for $15 billion in US agricultural crops each year. And if we want to, in the question and answer session, I can talk about some of the threats to pollinators and to insects at large. Um, but I wanted to end there to give us time to chat further. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much as well. Can I share now, Courtney? Sorry? I'm going to stop sharing screen. Did that okay. work? Sure, yeah. Great. I'm just going to change my view so I can see everyone. So we have a couple questions in the chat. So Li Zhang is asking, has there been genetic manipulation or selection to increase the production and quality of secretion by or of insects? Absolutely. Yeah. Most, of, most of the silk now being produced um, globally uh, is, is produced by genetically modified silkworms that have been modified to produce at much greater yield rates, and also modified to produce stronger silk. Silk is, is remarkable on its own without genetic modification because, you know, it's as strong as steel and, um, and extremely pliable, but there's been a constant process since probably 1992 of, of attempts to genetically enhance the silkworm. That has not been true to my knowledge of either shellac or cochineal, where the natural products without being genetically modified have seemed to produce such an array of desirable products without any major scientific investment. But in the case of the silkworm, the modification is both intensive and extensive. Yeah, yeah. And if you want it, I, I can recommend readings on that, some of which are simply in the bibliography of the book. Great. Um, and then Gail's question is, should the FDA be required to further describe what is in our food, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so one of the fascinating aspects of the research for this project was the discovery that insect body parts are in just about everything. And the FDA allows far more than a modicum of them. Um, there's a quota in coffee and peanut butter, you name it of insect body parts. And so you probably are munching on, on mandibles and wings without even, without even knowing it. And the most diehard vegan even who's committed to eating non-animal products is certainly eating insect body parts. And I talk about that a little in the book. I'm not terribly concerned about it because it's probably more sanitary and safe than a lot of the other practices that are allowed in our food system. I teach a course on the history of food and one of the things I chronicle with my students is a real sort of narrative of decline. Since Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, one would have thought that things would have gotten better, but there's been a loosening of regulations in America's food industry. And you can just read books like Eric Schlosser's Fast Food Nation or Michael Pollan's food writing to trace this decline and less and less is regulated. So I'm far less worried about insect body parts, which are largely sterile and are not going to do anything to you than I am a whole host of other practices in American slaughterhouses and American agribusiness, where we're seeing rates of food poisoning on the, on the incline in dramatic ways, E. coli rates. Um, we, we talk about this and work with this a lot in my courses. So I'm far less concerned with eating a few bug parts here and there, and much more concerned with getting an active FDA and these other areas of the economy where, where we've lost a lot of ground. 
Yeah, but but some people are um, vegetarian, so. <laughs> Absolutely, and that, yeah, I mean. Not um, me, but uh, yeah. I have a friend who got E. coli poisoning from eating romaine lettuce in California, and she's a committed vegetarian, and, and you know, it's partly because um, they were using untreated cow manure as fertilizer, um, and the process should have been regulated better, and, um, you know, it was clear that that was the vector for a whole bunch of, of cases of an E. coli outbreak. And that's a committed vegetarian who's making a salad. Um, and I just think, you know, if we want to talk about regulation of the food industry, that's a really good conversation. Um, but I'd love to see it in the places where it, really the choke points where it's going to matter a ton. Um, go ahead, Connie. Uh, you're on mute. Hold on. Let's see. <laughs> Almost. Hmm. There we go. Unmute. I found it. I'm just curious. I know that you, the title of your book is The Butterfly Effect, and this has nothing to do with food sources, but are you seeing any changes in the monarch butterfly population? I seem to have gone from none many years ago to a lot more now. And is there something we can do to continue to help that improve? Yeah, the monarch butterfly population is in dramatic decline. And it's a great sort of indicator species for much more widespread trends. Um, upwards of 40% of insect species are in decline and a third are endangered globally. Um, and it's partly because we have pursued a type of farming that uses really very toxic chemicals. Um, and I think moving away from that is the big picture change that's gonna need to happen. At the local level, one thing you can do is actually simply plant milkweed. Uh, and that's what a lot of my neighbors have done. And it was fun, I was out with my son the other day looking at monarch butterfly eggs on the underside of milkweed plants in their neighbor's garden. And milkweed is the food source and the natural habitat for migrating monarchs. And so you can create your own little enclave. If you're feeling like a lot of these big picture stories are daunting, there is that sort of local thing that can be done. But on the, the, the sort of big picture story there is that it's a lot about habitat protection. And, and the, the roosting areas in central Mexico where many migrating monarchs go for the winter are under dramatic threat from deforestation. And in fact, several of the activists who've been trying to protect those forest areas have been killed in recent years. And there's a big picture political story about the monarch butterfly that needs to be part of our diplomacy in thinking about how do we protect the sort of migrating domains of these creatures that are so fundamental both for their beauty and for the role they play as pollinators in our food system. So there's sort of multiple tiers to my answer. At the local level, yeah, create habitats for monarchs. Um, at the big picture political level, there needs to be a lot of habitat protection efforts. I mean, I've seen the monarch decline in California. I talk about in the 1990s being out there as a grad student and going to Santa Cruz and visiting the eucalyptus trees where the monarchs would overwinter there. And it used to be that you would see hundreds of thousands, if not millions. And I went back about 15 years later to the same grove in Santa Cruz, and it was a shadow of its former self in terms of the monarch numbers. So you can see this sort of physical evidence of the decline at an anecdotal level, but we know statistically that that's, that's also happening. And it has a lot to do with habitat destruction. You know, there are other factors and variables that are playing into all this um, as well. Climate change is certainly a big part of it, um, but also the use of chemicals like neonicotinoids, which are a class of pesticides that mimic nicotine, um, that seem to be incredibly destructive to honeybees. Um, and as we're trying to understand colony collapse disorder, the death, the massive die off of honeybees, we're kind of getting to the bottom of the root causes of that. And it's a matrix of issues. It's probably not just one thing, but when you put it all together, politics has to be part of, part of the story as well. So, so. Oh, but is there any decline of the um, 
two kinds of insects other than the silk. I feel like silkworms are not. But the first one and the third one, the red producing dyes, uh, is there any decline of those insects where there is enough of a demand that there is an increase? Yeah, cochineal and shellac have had explosive growth in terms of the number of people employed. The places where it's produced is changing. The cochineal industry has largely moved from southern Mexico to Peru, but in Peru there are about 100,000 families who this is their main livelihood currently, and there are massive markets emerging in Asia, Europe, and the United States, both in the food industry, but also for all sorts of other reasons. People, I have a friend, she makes quilts in California and her quilts are on display in London right now at an art gallery and all the red dye she uses is cochineal because she finds that its fixative properties are much more durable than the synthetic alternatives that she used to use. So, uh, so there, there, there is no decline for either one of those two. No decline for either one. And in fact, there's growth that I talk about quite a bit. Yeah, in because it also provides um, uh, work opportunities. Do those insects have those, because they are not like silkworms and they uh, live in the wild outside. Do they have um, animes? Do they have other insects and birds and they, they eat them? So... Yeah, and that was a constant preoccupation in, in, as you read through the sort of history of cochineal was protecting cochineal bugs from rats and mice and chickens love to eat them and there are all sorts of worms that consume them and so farmers had to come up with all sorts of strategies to sort of protect these tiny insects. Shellac is, is less frequently consumed um, than, than the cochineal bug by other wild predators. <laughs> But in all three cases, there are wild progenitors that are ancestors of these bugs that then exist also parallel to the domesticated versions of these insects. And those can sometimes be the sources of things like wild silk, which is valued for a whole host of different properties. It captures light in different ways when you make fabric from it. It's much harder to get. And there's wild shellac and wild cochineal as well. And so people have long relied on both the domesticated and the wild populations of these mm. insects in various So places. then the, 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 go ahead. I, I guess there may be other questions. Um, I was just gonna go back to your situation with the honeybees. And yeah. that is not only how important they are, but there are North American native honeybees but if you look out on your plants, there are a lot of other honeybees, which are um, non-native species. And what are the issues with pollination and crops and, and how is that all working out? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole, it's, it's a can of insects, a can of worms with invasive species because there's so many threats to non, there are about 20,000 species of native insect pollinators, not all of them are bees. Some of them are flies, some of them are beetles, some of them are moths in the continental United States. And those have faced major threat from invasive species over time. And we have, I chronicle a number of those stories in the book that were fascinating and often horrifying to research. Um, and then some of the threats are not invasive species at all. They're things like there's a parasite, the Varroa destructor, I love its name because it really conveys what it's doing, that sucks out the hemolymph, which is insect blood of the honeybee young and kills the entire colony. To the point where, you know, I mean, you may not know this, but California's almond crop is, is the, se the seventh most lucrative agricultural export from the United States. And it's entirely dependent on bees that are brought in on big trucks from across the country, from Florida, most of them, to pollinate the entire California almond crop. Millions and well, billions of trees and trillions of bees. And, and the folks who keep those bees as a living have been noticing massive die-offs among their colonies and are really, really concerned. And I think it's like I'm saying, it's a matrix of things, habitat destruction, climate change, invasive species, pesticides and newly introdu introduced chemicals, and then, and then parasites that have, that have plagued 
Um, these and are, it's the same with the blueberries in Maine. They also bring in honeybees to pollinate the wild blueberries on the blueberry barrens. Oh, I didn't know that. I've heard that. Have you, have you seen? Oh, yeah. They bring in huge flatbed trucks with the hives on the trucks. Yep. And they pull in to the barrens, various barrens around the area, let them out. They pollinate the, the flowers of the uh, just the burgeoning blueberry, low, low bush blueberries. Most of these cases are the wild blueberries. Yeah, to uh, pollinate the crops, but they're having a lot of trouble keeping the bees healthy and safe. Fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it in California, but not in Maine. So, and it's, it's a story that most people don't really know about. We kind of think about pollination just sort of happens and it's plant sex and, and that's how plants do it. <laughs> and, um, but, but yet there's a backstory to all of it. And, and the book, I, I really had a lot of fun coming to an understanding of how our knowledge of pollination emerged. Uh, and I talk a lot about Darwin and also a really wonderful woman who should be getting a lot more credit uh, in scientific circles and in popular circles, Maria Sibylla Marian, um, who in, in 1699, she traveled with her daughter from the Netherlands to Suriname. They were unaccompanied and they went to Suriname for three years and studied insect life cycles and pollination. And she is kind of the mother of entomology and is under-recognized. And I spent quite a bit of time in the book telling her story and and it's kind of the story of the backstory of our understanding of pollination in fact um, mm -hmm. so I hope you enjoy that if you get a chance to dip into the book because that was one of the most fun parts of the book to write it's great I'm just going to jump in I think we got Marie's question answered about the total insect population and decline and then Gail is asking what is your what are your thoughts on drinking almond milk and its effect and I have a similar question so you know, almond milk versus cow's milk, and the cows are a problem. <laughs> I guess building off that question, what are some uh, exciting or innovative substitutes that you've seen? I think the great innovative substitute is oat milk, because almond milk is extremely environmentally costly to make. Um, it uses just an enormous amount of water to both produce the almonds and make the almond milk. And the, sort of the inefficiency has been studied pretty extensively by folks in the food studies world. And if you were to rank things in terms of wastefulness, almond milk would be really high on the list, unfortunately. Okay. But the great substitute, and I find it actually is pretty, pretty tasty and palatable, and it passes muster with my seven-year-old, who's pretty a, a picky eater, is oat milk. And oat milk is extremely simple to make and very efficient, and it can be locally produced. Almonds have to be shipped, They're, they almost always come from California and, mm -hmm. and at massive fossil fuel cost as well to ship them. And, and so if you're looking for a sustainable alternative that will mimic cow milk decently, and you can cook with it. I made pancakes the other day with oat milk and, and my son Simon did not um, miss a beat. So I'm thinking it was okay. Uh, I think you, you, you do well with that and they actually serve it I don't know, your local cafes, before the pandemic, I always was getting coffee at Amherst Coffee, and there are a ton of people who get their coffee with oat milk there, and they offer it as one of their alternatives now, um, because it's, it's a, decent, a decent analog, and it's so much more sustainable. So if you're looking from, from the sort of green perspective of what you'd want to consume as, as an alternative, that would be my, <laughs> I hope that answers your question. Well, I can tell you, I see the almond groves. I'm originally from Tucson, Arizona, and they have now um, cultivated a whole lot of desert area around Tucson with almond groves, and it looks like corridors of uh, channels of water, I mean, in a place where there is no water. And so it's such a huge waste of water and space to create the almonds for that crop. It's just it just makes your heart break when you see it. Yeah, and, and it's, it's funny because China is going in the opposite direction with this story. They have decided they've now created a water board that is trying strategically to figure out how to keep as much water as possible within Chinese national borders. My dad's an ecologist and he's 
actually a member of the Chinese National Academy, and he's been asked to consult with this group. And one of the things they've decided to do is import all their almonds from the United States because it's such a water intensive, water expensive crop that all the almonds everyone consumes in China now are coming from the US because they're letting us waste our water. And it's a smart move because they're saying, why would anyone want to do this? Um, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so I think that's a telltale sign that maybe we, we want to pursue a different path here. Um, <laughs> in terms of, of our use of resources, so. Marie, did you have a question? No, uh, no thank you. <laughs> I, I, I have one, we just, uh, we just had a program the other day on plastics and how these seas of plastic bags are ending up in Southeast Asia and um, I forgot where I'm going there, but I, uh, when you were talking about shellac and rubber and are there any new solutions for that kind of, for packaging and stuff that could decompose from insects um, as opposed to plastic? Yeah, well, that's actually one of the areas, I talk about this in the book, that shellac has become a fascinating substitute. A lot of researchers are now trying to think about biodegradable electronics. Hmm. Two reasons, both for the environmental sustainability of them, because e-waste, that's produced just is accumulating mostly in the developing world. It's shipped there in massive landfills full of toxic and pre-toxic material. And if you could create biodegradable electronics that would degrade, degrade in you know, a tenth of the lifetime of our current electronics, you could begin to solve some of that waste flow problem, but also for wearable electronics. The future of healthcare is gonna be about electronics in and on our bodies that are monitoring things that our organs are doing and then sending feedback to doctors and administering medicines actually on site within and on our bodies. And shellac as a non-toxic substance that most human bodies tolerate really well is kind of a centerpiece of a lot of that research because hmm. people have realized you can create plastic-like analogs with shellac that look almost like a circuit board and make them in miniature out of shellac. And then they're safe for the human body to either digest or have implanted in or on them. And so this went way beyond where I was expecting that chapter to go, but I got really enthralled with the literature on all this. And there's a part of the book where I talk about this, thinking about biodegradable substances that are made out of shellac. I don't think anyone's making shopping bags yet out of it, but what I would just suggest there is once, once grocery stores let you begin to bring your own bags, just bring them. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've, in Hadley now, they're, they're allowing people to bring their own bags again. So I just have them in the trunk of my car. And, um, you know, because in a lot of countries and places, I, I, I have spent a lot of time in the Pacific and I lived in Hawaii for a while and Fiji and Tonga. And a lot of those island nations are either banning or considering banning plastic bags entirely because the, the cost to marine fisheries has been enormous and they have nowhere to put all the landfill. And it's just being sent around. You know, there, in these stories, there was one in the Atlanta chronicling a ship that was just sailing around the Pacific full of plastic waste and no one was willing to accept it. And, and that's a troubling future. So let's figure out, you know, they're pretty pretty simple alternatives if you if you bring your own bags you can you can you can do a lot at least there to make an inroad yeah does anyone else have a question oh gail uh, asked i'm sorry kathy one second yes, gail, gail yes. was asking about soy milk uh i have a question about your affiliation with is it chile or peru what, chile. what work chile yeah. What is your work there? Oh, yeah, that's a that's a fun whole other direction. But I did my my doctoral dissertation was on the long connections between Chile and the state of California. Mm -hmm. um, and there are 222 years of those, as it turns out. Um, the potato came from Chile oh. to California with La Perouse in the 1780s. And then I traced this connection all the way up to 2008 when uh, Michelle Bachelet, who was then president of Chile, visited Arnold Schwarzenegger in California 
It's a great photo op because she's about 5'2", and of course she's a hunking bodybuilder, and they were walking around in the grape vineyards of, of UC Davis looking at all the Chilean varieties that, that California has grown. And so I lived down there for about five months while I was writing my dissertation and mm -hmm. had a good time. And then I went back when I was working on the book and I'm still very close with a lot of Chilean friends and colleagues. And there's a Chile, California organization that does conferences and I've spoken several times to them. And um, so that, that's in my, my first book, Strangers on Familiar Soil is about that. Hmm. It, was a, it was a lot of fun to write. I had not known, you know, that alfalfa came to the United States from Chile or that, um, all the, the, the first wave of prostitutes in San Francisco were Chilean women who came trying to make a living during the gold rush. And um, much of the, the early history of San Francisco was emanating from Chilecito, which, which was um, now near North Beach and, and uh, has a really interesting history. So I ended up consulting with the San Francisco city government on a series of plaques that they did brass plaques that show places where ships from foreign merchant marines were buried under the San Francisco waterfront. And there are mm. 92 Chilean ships buried in the San Francisco waterfront wow. because their crews abandoned their ships to go find gold in the Sierra Nevadas. And, and there was wow. no, they just simply filled them in with sand and made the San Francisco waterfront. So if you're walking around someday after the pandemic in Fisherman's Wharf, you're literally walking over the entombed skeletons of the Chilean merchant marine. And my book talks a lot about that. <laughs> totally different subject, but a lot of fun. I have one more question about shellac. Is, is the demand actually increasing? And if so, is the supply also keeping up with the demand? Does that require any like environmental or uh, just uh, the land, an increase in the use of land for that. How's that going? Yeah, it's a pretty low intensity process because you've got to, the trees mature over several years and then you've got to maintain them. So it's fairly sustainable. And one of the neat things that I discuss a lot in the book is how women have benefited from non-timber forest products throughout Southeast Asia and that it's a cottage industry for a lot of women in India, Thailand, Burma, Southern China, and the shellac industry is kind of finger-like. It's spread out across Southeast Asia and relative to other industries like rubber, it is extremely sustainable. Mm -hmm. Whereas rubber and palm oil have meant the large-scale replacement of native forests with monocultures mm -hmm. That have, that have wreaked havoc on those ecosystems. Um, so all in all, if you compare shellac to, to those industries, it's, it's a sustainable cousin um, and it's really beneficial often to women who don't have other sources of livelihood. And in the book, I really am trying to explore all these people who are sort of on the periphery of the high-tech world system, but are making a living with these substances that have come back into our daily lives in all these seemingly unimaginable ways, but yet, you know, they're in our dental fillings and on our pills and in our children's candy and coloring our, our foodstuffs and, and sort of here, there, and everywhere. And that was the most surprising thing was to sort of find out how ubiquitous these, these things are in our daily lives. So there, is there any uh, automation or machinery in, uh, extracting the uh, dyes from these insects. Mm -hmm. You showed a Mexican woman, woman trying to uh, just grind up the, uh, the red dye, but is there an automation for that? And if there is, it could replace the, uh, the woman. So. Yeah, the funny thing when I did this research, and I've been to all the places except Assam, India. I've spent I've traveled quite extensively in, in China in 1995 and 2001, and I've been to southern Mexico and highland Peru, um, is the, the lack of automation. Uh, there have been attempts to automate shellac production, but one of the findings of that was that the quality of the product dramatically declined from automation. And so shellac, and I've seen countless videos of this, and you can find them on YouTube, is still produced using the BATA method 
which is over a furnace, they take these long cotton bags and they throw chips of shellac in and then melt the shellac in the bag onto a flat surface, stretch it out using their mouth and their feet into these towel sized um, chunks of shellac, break it down. And that's still largely the production process. And for cochineal, it's similar too. It's still mostly produced as a cottage industry and is hand ground. And I think the sort of economics of automation because these are really rural industries has lagged behind and, 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 and not been viable. And so silk is probably the exception to that. There's been a lot of automation in silk, although there've been real questions from the fashion industry about the quality of the silk produced by automated processes. And so there's a big demand for hand spun silk still. And there are a lot of, lot of people throughout the developing world who are, 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 are still involved in hand spinning silk. So I think you know it's the questions of quality, the rural nature of it, um, and some of the failures of automation and economies of scale that might be the drivers for why it's still still really a, a handcraft in all three cases. So what portion of the silk supply is uh, from um, the natural uh, process? What pro what portion of it is natural silk as opposed to the machine produced, do you know? Oh, the machine produced is very small in total. I mean, silk only oh, occupies 2% two, two of the global fabric trade, but it's a kind of illusory figure because a lot of it in countries is consumed domestically. Um, you know, for example, in India, 82% of the silk produced, it's all hand-thrown, no mechanized silk, and it's all consumed domestically to make saris. And I talk about in the book all the fascinating ways in which silk has been used in, in, to, to actually become a filter for water for women who need an inexpensive way to get cholera-free water. They use their silk saris as filters for, for filtering river water. Um, and so in that case, there's very little mechanized silk. Um, in China, much more of the silk production is mechanized, as one might expect. Um, but I don't know the statistics on that globally. I'd have to look that up. Um, does China export it silk or does it also consume most of it? It exports a lot of silk. It's the primary, it's the world's largest silk exporter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And thus, I talk a lot about the Silk Road in the book and I had a lot of fun thinking about and writing about that because of course, so, you know, for a historian, there's there's hardly anything more fascinating than something mm -hmm. that, you know, connects all of Eurasia. And of mm -hmm. course, the Mongols who create the Pax Mongolica, we don't think of the Mongols and peacefulness, but uh, there was there was the legend that, that during the Mongol Empire, a woman could travel with a golden nugget in her headdress and be completely safe the entire length of the Silk Road because the Mongols wanted to protect this really crucial trade corridor. And so in the 13th century, you know, there's this massive avenue of camel trails open between Europe and China that is a really remarkable thing in world history as a conduit of, you know, food and religion and culture. And um, so, you know, what I'm doing here is using insect stories to tell other tales as well. Um, <laughs> so. And we have time for one more question. I have a written just about, I just ask about its scale, the soy milk instead. I mean, I knew almond milk was a problem. I just wanted my husband to hear him say that it's a problem. <laughs> so, yes, so, soy, soy, milk is, soy milk is a mess. My, my initial doctoral dissertation um, was, was actually about the history of the global history of the soybean because I started graduate school in Chinese history and then ended up working on Latin America as well. And the story of soy is a complicated one and I can recommend readings if you want, but soy production is, is truly awful because of the degree <laughs> to which it involves chemical regimes of modernity that are pretty awful really? and station for soy production. Um, if you, I've flown over the Amazon, my dad's an ecologist who works in the Brazilian Amazon, and we've flown over Arai Maggi's plantations in Mato Grosso, and you're flying 
in a Cessna for like two, three hours and everything underneath you for the whole time is rainforest that's been turned into soy plantation. And that's all you see. Um, and it's just a massive transformation of the world's tropical rainforests into soy and rubber plantations is disheartening. Um, so sad to say, I'd go with oat milk over soy milk if you really want me to weigh in. <laughs> oat milk it is. Thank you so much. And also, we, so I hope we, that, that offered some utility for... No, no, that, that, was, that was good. I knew almond milk was a problem. I didn't know that soy milk was a problem. But um, also, um, we just got some milkweed from a, from a neighbor. Um, so we're going to be planting some as well. Great. Get, my son and I were so excited to find monarch eggs uh, and caterpillars on the milkweed in our neighbor's yard. So that was really neat. Yeah, thank you. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes. Oh, thank yes. you. Wonderful. Yeah, I think this is a great place to end. Thank you again for coming and uh, we look forward to your next book. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.